let me start today we shall be discussing about the petroleum source rock and how the petroleum gets generated when i say source rock what does this mean because we are already aware that petroleum is the petra plus oleum that is the uh, rock oil so there should be some source and we'll understand that is it always that we find petroleum in the source rock so the first question here which uh, you have to answer is that do we extract petroleum from source rock and second question today which we shall be discussing will be that how the petroleum gets generated generated in the source rock because once we are talking about the petroleum then we have to look at several factors right from the deposition of organic matter to the generation of petroleum okay so let us begin so as i have already told you petroleum is petra plus oleum that is rock plus oil and it includes both oil and gas that is the petroleum exists in liquid form as well as gaseous form so we shall normally refer the petroleum as hydrocarbon okay it is a very complex composition the petroleum has a very very complex composition and then uh, this complexity of the composition it tells us that petroleum generation is not an easy process it is not a simple process it requires a lot of uh, processes which are involved in the origin of petroleum then accumulation of petroleum and over the long periods of time what happens to that petroleum normally the origin of petroleum is never in the reservoir accumulation from which it is produced what does this statement mean this statement is that normally this is the first question which i asked you in the beginning that do we extract petroleum from the source rock so this statement says that origin of petroleum is never in the reservoir accumulation from which it is produced it means that uh, if we are looking uh, at a rock from where the petroleum is being extracted it is being produced then this is a general rule that except in some cases except in some cases it is a general rule that the oil which we are producing from a rock was not generated in that i'll explain this once more ki jis rock se hum petroleum nikalte hain normally wo petroleum us rock mein nahi bana hota hai wo us rock mein aakar ke collect hota hai accumulate hota hai lekin usme wo banta nahi hai it doesn't get generated in that rock rather the petroleum gets generated in the source rock and we extract the petroleum from the reservoir rock so this you have to understand that the petroleum or the hydrocarbons they get generated means they are formed in the source rock while we produce or we extract petroleum from reservoir rock what simple sa i'll give you an example that everybody has water tank installed at their home so we fill in water in that tank and then we use the water but is that water uh, originally from the tank no that water is normally the ground water which we pump using high energy uh, submersibles or pumps okay so this brings us to the concept of petroleum system so how is petroleum system defined petroleum system is uh, uh is, you know it is an array of rocks three types of rocks 
which are the source rock, the reservoir rock, and a seal or a cap rock. So, if we talk about the general conception, then source rock is the one where the petroleum is generated. So, here origin of petroleum. Then we get the reservoir rock where petroleum is accumulated accumulated and then above this reservoir rock is the cap rock so what does cap rock do cap rock locks locks or arrests arrests the petroleum in the reservoir rock imagine that the petroleum has is formed in the source rock from there it has moved to reservoir rock but there is no uh, uh, no cap rock so it might happen that petroleum may go to somewhere else so here if you look at this diagram so beautiful diagram where number one here the petroleum gets generated so this number one over here it is the source rock now petroleum it uh, since it is a labile substance or it is not a solid substance so it can move so from the source rock the petroleum moves to another rock which is where the migration occurs and this is called as the reservoir rock reservoir rock okay now this process of migration so there are two types of migrations first one is called as the primary migration the primary migration is the type of migration in which the hydrocarbon goes from source rock to reservoir rock okay so you can see here this number two that the uh, hydrocarbon is moving or petroleum is moving from the source rock from where it got generated to the reservoir rock which is called as primary migration and the secondary migration the second type of migration is the secondary migration what is the meaning of secondary migration the secondary migration is that the petroleum or the hydrocarbon that has come into the reservoir rock is now moving towards the place where it is getting accumulated means from source rock to reservoir rock the primary migration and within the reservoir rock secondary migration so source rock it generates petroleum under proper subsurface temperature and pressure conditions now once the petroleum gets generated then how it is expelled how it is going out of the rock that is by sediment compaction leads to expulsion of petroleum from the source into the reservoir rock that is called as primary migration okay now what has happened the source rock in which the petroleum was formed due to the overburden pressure due to the overload the petroleum it gets uh, you know expelled because of the sediment compaction it gets expelled from the source rock and then it goes into the reservoir rock for a rock to be called as reservoir rock it must have sufficient porosity and permeability to allow the flow of petroleum through the pore system which is called as secondary migration so an essential point over here is that the source rock normally should be non permeable like shales so they are non permeable that is why they generate and hold the petroleum so once the pressure is put on the sediments of the source rock they get compacted and they release the petroleum it enters the overlying reservoir rock so if the reservoir rock is a non porous or non permeable then neither uh, uh, primary migration will occur nor secondary migration will occur after that the sedimentary strata structural configurations cause the reservoir rocks to form traps for accumulation of petroleum now you can see over here the number four this is an 
this is a fold an anticline or an antiform this fold what it does so if let us say this is the type of fold over here and oil is moving in this uh, in this rock strata and it comes over here it gets accumulated at the top of the anticline or antiform here at this hinge the pressure is maximum at the hinge you all are aware that the pressure in an antiformal structure is maximum at the hinge so what happens over here it does not allow this petroleum to go anywhere else as a result it gets trapped over there that is why this structure is called as trap we will discuss the different types of traps normally there are three types the structural traps stratigraphic traps and hydrodynamic traps so we'll look at them in detail later and then the last one is the traps they are sealed sealed by impermeable sediment layer which are known as cap rock so imagine that from this number four if the, even though this is a trap but if this is not sealed by any other rock so this uh, this uh, structural trap is also permeable so what will happen oil may go from here it may leak from here to prevent that leakage it is sealed by a cap rock so this number one is source rock number this one number two and three they are the reservoir rock number four it is the structural trap and then over here this blue color this is the cap rock this is what is called as the petroleum system so you have if you are asked to write an answer on discuss the uh, discuss in detail the parts of a conventional petroleum system then this is how you have to draw the diagram and then this is how you have to explain it that a petroleum system consists of different parts starting from the source rock reservoir rock trap and then seal or cap rock for the source rock the rock should be non permeable and it should contain sufficient amount of organic matter otherwise petroleum will not get generated then the reservoir rock the reservoir rock is normally overlying or is it uh, it is in not overlying but it is in contact with the uh, source rock so what will happen the uh, oil once gets generated in the source rock gets expelled due to the sediment compaction or overburden pressure then it is called as primary migration then the same oil moves in the uh, uh, in the reservoir rock and goes to the uh, uh, it, it goes to the place of accumulation where it gets trapped by the structural trap or stratigraphic trap this trap only may get sealed by a cap rock which allows the petroleum to stay over there so if in future some company decides to drill over here then they may produce petroleum so this is a diagram of a drilling rig so they then this is the well but imagine that if the seal rock or cap rock was not there and petroleum got migrated away somewhere else again then if you drill over here in four you will not get oil that is the importance of seal rock or cap rock okay let us move ahead so this is a conventional petroleum system here there are five elements first one is the source so what is source source is a deposit rich in organic matter which typically consists of remains of phytoplanktons a typically fine grained marine or lacustrine sediment that is an organic rich shale it must have been buried to a depth at which it was subjected to a considerable temperature for considerable time means for any rock to be called as a source rock it should be rich in organic matter because it is the organic matter which will uh, give rise to the petroleum then it should be fine grained marine sediment or lacustrine sediment why, why we, we don't uh, go for the aqueous or so or riverine sediment i'll come in a bit so the best types of source rocks normally are produced in lacustrine or lake setting or uh, marine setting okay then 
these these sediments which constitute the source rock they should be buried at appropriate depth they should neither be too shallow then they will release only the biogenic methane if they are coming in the oil and gas window at proper temperature that is from 60 to 150 degree celsius that is the oil window and from 150 to 250 degree celsius it is the gas window if the sediments of the source rock they are within this temperature range only then they will generate the petroleum if it again goes much deeper and goes beyond 250 degree celsius it will give rise to dry or thermogenic methane and furthermore it will give rise to graphite which will be of no use so this is how a source rock uh, is defined we will discuss the details of source rock in the coming slides after the source uh, rock generates the uh hydrocarbon then migration occurs so migration as i have explained is of two types primary and secondary in primary migration the petroleum moves from the source rock to the reservoir rock okay remember never get confused if the oil is moving within the reservoir rock it is secondary migration if it is moving from source rock to reservoir rock it is primary migration then the so what is migration the migration pathway it a porous and permeable conduit from source to reservoir conduit means uh, an opening a pipe like structure so we saw that the source rock was normally a shale the or or impermeable fine grain because if they will be coarse grain they are ought to develop porosity and permeability but the uh, migration pathway a porous and permeable conduit from source to reservoir commonly or a layer of sand or sandstone or a fault or fracture system so what will happen here is that if the uh, uh, source rock which is fine grain is overlaid over uh, is overlain by sands or sandstone which is a type of porous rock or permeable rock then after the expulsion of petroleum the petroleum may enter the sandstone or if the shale gets fractured the shale which is the source rock gets fractured fracture plane the fault plane is a plane of weakness so the, along that fault plane the oil might migrate okay then comes the reservoir rock the reservoir rock is it is a typically porous and permeable material in which the hydrocarbons reside typically a layer of sandstone or limestone could be a fractured stratum of impermeable rock as well so for the reservoir rock it is important for it to have porous and porosity and permeability now what happens is that the porosity and permeability uh, they are the uh, indigenous features of sandstones because sandstones they are uh, normally coarse grain and so the grain contact over there gives us the porosity and permeability and then limestone the carbonate rocks they are also form uh, good reservoir rocks because they develop secondary porosity due to the uh, solution solution by the or dissolution by the chemically active fluids so normally these are the types of reservoir rocks then we get the trap the trap a concave downward geometric arrangement concave downward so normally we are looking at the best type of traps are formed by the antiforms or anticlines a concave downward geometric arrangement of seal and or perme of perme impermeable lateral equivalence of reservoir rock so if the reservoir rock gets uh, folded okay then it gives uh rise to a trap or an or a stratigraphic pinch out it is also a uh, type of trap and it must exist in three dimensions so you can see over here the limbs of this anticline and then uh, how they stop the oil from moving out okay so we will also look at the uh, details of the petroleum traps later and then comes the seal or the cap rock so it is typically an impermeable ductile stratum it is very important for seal rock to be impermeable so normally shales 
or evaporites what do they do they stop the further upward migration and so the oil stays in its place so these are the five elements of a conventional petroleum system this is an excellent diagram from the uh, railbacks petroleum geoscience and subsurface geology book you can use this diagram to answer the question on the discuss in detail or draw the uh, constituents or parts of a petroleum system all right now let us look at the first component that is the petroleum source rock so time and again i have been telling you that petroleum source rock they need to be fine grained clay rich siliciclastic rock or dark colored carbonate rock so we have normally two types of uh, rocks which form the petroleum source rock they can be mudstones or shales or limestones and marls so you can ask here that why limestones because limestones they are uh, non-clastic rocks and they do not have the primary porosity therefore if they have large amount of organic matter or suffi suffi uh, sufficient amount of organic matter in them then they act as very good source rock so the source rocks they can either be if they are siliciclastic they need to be clay rich because clays are non-permeable and they block the permeability of the existing rock and then if they are carbonate rock limestones and mass so they are characterized by three essential conditions first one sufficient organic matter if the organic matter is less or it is not there then petroleum will not get generated there is another scenario that let us say that there is organic matter in the source rock but it is not sufficient let us say uh, you have a bucket bucket of five liters and you put in that bucket two liters of water so that water will remain inside the bucket howsoever you push the bucket the water will not come out it will not spill out but if you have a five liter bucket and you have filled it to, to the full to the brink and then again if you add water or if you try to uh, push that bucket the water will fall out the, in the same way if the rock has certain uh, holding capacity of petroleum but the organic matter is not sufficient for the uh, petroleum to fill the entire rock it will never get expelled while if the organic matter is sufficient enough that is kerogen is sufficient enough for uh, the petroleum to fill the rock only then when the once the compaction will occur then the rock will expel the petroleum so let me just show you a conceptual diagram let us say that this is a shale these are all clay particles and here the black color one it is petroleum or hydrocarbon you can see here that this hydrocarbon is not completely filling the source rock as a result if you even if you apply whatever amount of pressure it will not come out but at the same time let us say that you have a source rock which has so much organic matter that it has completely filled it has completely filled the rock with which is completely filled the rock with the petroleum so once that happens So once that happens, then if you apply pressure on these sediments, then this petroleum will get expelled. It comes out like this. So this is all the droplets of that petroleum. So you have to understand the importance of sufficient amount of organic matter. Second one. The organic matter should be hydrogen rich so that it is movable. If the organic matter is poor in hydrogen content, then what will happen? If the 
uh, it is poor in hydrogen content then it will not be labile it will not move freely and if the uh, hydrocarbon is not moving freely it will not be able to enter the reservoir rod and third one the proper depth of burial to facilitate appropriate subsurface temperature depending on the geothermal gradient at what depth the sediments are will decide whether it is in the oil window gas window or it is in the biogenic methane zone okay so these three conditions are very important first one sufficient organic matter so that the petroleum fills the uh, source rock and on compaction it releases the petroleum second one organic matter should be hydrogen rich to facilitate the movement and third one proper depth of burial so that the temperatures which are getting generated should be there okay then the to toc means total organic content or total organic carbon for silici clastic rocks for silici clastic rocks the petroleum uh, or not petroleum for petroleum generation the uh, toc should be 1.5 percent at least okay there should be at least uh, 1.5 percent toc for silici clastic that is shales and for carbonate rocks it should be a minimum of 0.5 percent only then the petroleum will get generated okay all right the source rocks they normally show uh, brown to black color due to the presence of finely disseminated organic matter so normally if the organic matter gets preserved in the sediments the color it gets black and then there are several times pyrite crystals these pyrite crystals which are iron sulfide they also give the uh, black color now why the carbonate rocks they have lesser amount of toc uh, than the silici clastic rock it has to do with the quality and composition of uh, the organic matter present in carbonate source rock the organic matter tends to be richer in the hydrogen and therefore the uh, uh the the toc content of uh, carbonate rock is significantly lower than the silici clastic rock all right okay now the you, you can see here on on your right side that pictures a and b you can see they are finely laminated structure all these structures they are finely laminated they are deposited in thin lamina or layers so this laminated structure is due to the deposition of organic matter rich clay which lithified during burial to become the source rock in the carbonate rocks the organic matter tends to be distributed in a heterogeneous way often concentrated in narrow bands formed by the pressure solution because in uh, uh, carbonate lithologies if you remember i had told you about the stylolites once we were discussing the, they are the pressure solution gradient so what happens is that carbonate rocks they are very prone to dissolution by pressure or by chemically active fluids so as a result the uh, uh, the uh, carbonate rocks they have this organic matter deposited in a heterogeneous way not as finely laminated in the shales okay and most source rock which have effectively generated and expelled commercial quantities of petroleum have toc concentrations in the order of 2 to 10 percent so this is the best quality of source rocks which have been found across the globe and then uh, they generate the petroleum in the second diagram over here these finely disseminated crystals they are of pyrite so you can see here how the 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 source rock looks like the first one is a field photograph second one is the uh, the for the same under the microscope okay so petroleum source rock we have just discussed what is the important thing uh, for a certain sediment or rock to be called as the source rock now how the petroleum source 
rock sediments get deposited. So normally, if it is a source rock, it tends to have higher organic matter content. So what happens over here is that in certain environment, there are dead organisms, the residues, the leftover. So this is the residue of the dead vegetal material. And I have been telling you that these are normally phytoplanktons or they are the algal material which form the kerogen, which is responsible for the generation of petroleum. So residues of these dead organisms along with sediments, they get deposited. Okay. Now, it is very important to see which type of depositional environment, which type of depositional environment is there, which causes the deposition of these dead organisms and sediments. If it is a sub-aerial environment, sub-aerial environment means it is exposed to atmosphere atmosphere so if it is exposed to atmosphere then what will happen over here it will be impacted by the presence of oxygen and then there shall be uh, weathering and erosion normally the weathering and erosion they simply remove the material but the quality of material it gets degraded Degraded by what? So in sub-aerial environment, it is rich in oxygen because it is in direct contact with the air. So it is rich in oxygen. What does oxygen do? The oxygen, oxygenic or aerobic environment. So this is an aerobic environment. It causes the growth of aerobic bacteria and this aerobic bacteria, it destroys, it digests the organic matter. So the chemical and microbial oxidation of the organic matter, it, it leads to the formation of carbon dioxide, ammonia, water and humus. So basically the complex organic matter, it is broken down, broken down into carbon dioxide, ammonia, water and humus. But let us say that some conditions are there where the uh, oxygen is less. So what will happen over here? So it, uh, if the oxygen is lowered, if the oxygen is less, then under such conditions, now um, here it is deficient in oxygen. The lake and marine environment is deficient in oxygen. So what will happen over here? In the lake that is marine, or uh, uh, lake or that is lacustrine and marine. So in the marine or lacustrine environment, the organic matter gets preserved in oxygen deficient environments. So what happens over this black color? It represents the phytoplanktons. So in the top layer of this stratified water, these phytoplankton, they do photosynthesis and then they get uh, blooms they grow in large amount large quantity then once they die they fall on the sea floor okay so this is the sea bottom or lake bottom they fall on those sediments these sediments they get preserved uh, this organic matter gets preserved in the sediments because of the deficiency in oxygen if you see this plot over here in this uh, stratified water system, you can see how the of this green one represents oxygen. So how the oxygen content reduces as we go from top to bottom or surface to bottom. While Can you still hear me? Somebody say yes, if you are able to hear me. Because net does... Yes, got... Okay, yes, we'll... sir. Okay, mute yourself. Carry on. We'll carry on. So here you can see that the uh, oxygen content, it decreases as we go from top to bottom or surface to the depth. So what happens over here is that this deficiency of oxygen and increase in the CO2 content, 
it helps to preserve the organic matter therefore this organic matter it gets preserved in the sediments and these sediments are essentially called as the source rock sediment so normally if the concentration of oxygen dissolved in the water it is less than 0.1 milliliter per liter so we can uh, deficient deficiency in oxygen it can be classified as anaerobic or dysaerobic so let me write if it is an aerobic environment here the oxygen concentration dissolved in the water it is less than 0 0.1 milliliter per liter okay if it is in the range of so that is anaerobic and what is dysaerobic dysaerobic environment here the ox dissolved oxygen it ranges from 0 0.1 to 1 1.0 milliliter per liter okay so if we have anaerobic or dysaerobic conditions then it is very good for the preservation of organic matter but if it is more than 1 milliliter per liter it is called as aerobic environment which is over here so here the oxygen content is normally uh, more than 1.0 milliliter per liter as a result the condition over here is oxidation here in this in this environment it is the reducing conditions while here it is the oxidizing condition so if the conditions are oxidizing then organic matter gets destroyed if the conditions are reducing then the organic matter gets preserved so you have to keep in mind this flow chart as to if it is not always 100% sure that if the dead organic matter or the dead uh, phytoplankton and residues are there they will always lead to formation of organic matter and petroleum it is not true it is dependent on several factors that in what type of environment they get deposited okay so <clears throat> there are three basic depositional scenarios which ensure favorable conditions of preservation of organic matter the first one is the stagnation model look at this diagram a now it says it requires a silled basin what are sills sills are the flat and horizontal uh, rock bodies within a basin that restrict the uh, water circulation with the open ocean so what happens over here here this is the sill so this sill it blocks the uh, inflow and you know outgoing of water with the open ocean so as a result over here you will get a very good stratification okay so water stratification is well established okay so this over here so you can see the top layer is low salinity lower layer is high salinity since the top layer is in the direct contact with the atmosphere and sun so there uh, it is getting replenished replenished with oxygen so the fresh water at the top it is having aerobic environment okay aerobic so this is aerobic or oxic environment and here this white line it represents the halocline if you remember i had told you what is halocline halocline is the gradient of salinity so below the halocline where high salinity water is there here the mixing is not proper because of this sill so what will happen this sill will lead to the law uh, to the uh, improper uh, circulation and when the circulation of water is not good when the mixing is not good then this becomes an aerobic or dysoxic environment so in the dysoxic or anaerobic environment the organic matter gets preserved well so here below the halocline lies a huge stagnant water mass which provides condition for favorable for preservation of dead bodies of algae that settle down so all the algal material just let me uh, try to draw if in the top layer all these black particles which i am drawing let us say these are algae 
these are the phytoplankton so what they do they do photosynthesis over there once they die they settle to the bottom their bodies they settle to the bottom okay the dead material and since the bottom waters they are poor in oxygen content they get preserved and thus this becomes organic matter rich sediment these sediments lead to the formation of uh, uh, petroleum source rock second is a productivity model i have explained explained to you in the oceanography lectures about upwelling so upwelling is the process in which the fertile water the water which are rich in nutrients they uh, come up, the bottom waters they come up to the surface so upwelling of fertile water across the shelf edges from the deep parts of the continental slope increases the productivity in the surface water so here this is the this is the, the continental slope area this is the shelf area so this fertile water comes up and then it goes in the surface water and there it creates you know uh, uh, good growing conditions large amount of nutrients and thus it leads to high productivity okay so in the surface water it is high productivity this leads to an enormous rise in the algal biomass that is phytoplankton they grow and this starts the food food chain say uh, the algal material is eaten by the or the phytoplanktons are eaten by the zooplankton zooplanktons are eaten by the fish and like that so once all these organisms die they sink on the sea floor they come they sink through this uh, water column and once they sink through the water column the aerobic bacteria starts to decompose those uh, you know decompose those uh, dead bodies due to this due to this great quantity of decaying organic matter oxygen is consumed very fast so this at this juncture oxygen is consumed very fast consumed very fast why so that this dead organic matter gets decomposed by the aerobic bacteria since oxygen is being consumed very fast then there is development of a disaerobic and anaerobic conditions which are there in the water column once the anaerobic conditions develop then this is uh, good enough for the uh, preservation of the organic matter so here you can see that once the due to upwelling large amount of uh, pop, of the phytoplanktons they bloom in the surface ocean they form the food chain and all those organisms once they die they are getting decomposed by the aerobic bacteria in this process the oxygen gets consumed very fast and therefore what happens over here is that the anaerobic or disaerobic conditions they develop and as a result what happens over here is that the organic matter which is falling or oh, sorry the uh, dead bodies which are falling on the surface of the uh, uh, ocean sediments they get preserved so this forms the organic matter rich sediment this is also called as the redox boundary there is a sharp contact between oxygen deficient bottom water and oxygen bearing water mass above so i'll just show you this white color line over here this is the redox boundary so this boundary it is called as redox boundary and then it is very sharp the layer above the redox boundary it is rich in oxygen the layer below the redox boundary it is poor in oxygen and therefore the organic matter content is higher in the sediments which are deposited below the redox boundary okay the toc content of sediment deposited in this environmental regime are in the order of 2 to 4 percent so you can see here that it is very very high because here the supply of the dead material and the uh, res the preservation of those dead materials they both are happening the third model is the oxygen minimum zone model i have explained to you previously what is an oxygen minimum zone normally once the 
conditions of high productivity are there then the organisms they res do respiration as well as once they die their uh, decomposition and decay also consumes oxygen so in the process there is a shortage of oxygen leading to the formation of oxygen minimum zone so this principal scenario leading to the deposition of organic matter rich sediment is controlled by the deep ocean circulation system deep ocean circulation system so what happens over here you all are aware how deep ocean circulation or thermohaline circulation operates what happens is that high density or hyperpycnal hyperpycnal means high salinity high density bottom water so you are you all are aware how the bottom waters or north atlantic deep water and antarctic deep water are formed so here the <clears throat> hyperpycnal bottom water which is generated in the arctic and antarctic oceanic realm they flow along the deep ocean topography and they flow from the polar areas towards the lower latitudes so what happens in the process you can see over here they are coming from this region so once they are coming it is very much possible that this water which is of high density it may encounter the water which is of low density but rich in nutrient that is they displace the nutrient rich water masses of relatively lower density so what happens let us say if this is some elevation and elevation means some topographic high and this water which is a high density water it is coming from over here and in this location this water is rich in nutrients but it is of low density so what will happen this high density water will push this water towards the surface so what this will do it will locally increase the nutrient content in the surface water and once the surface water gets uh, nutrient content again this productivity model or the same process may take place that here there is establishment of open ocean oxygen minimum zone due to the upwelling so whenever this oxygen minimum zone it, it comes over here in the continental shelf because now this water has been pushed over here nutrient rich water so this will increase the productivity again the same process this which you saw in the b this will go uh, and operate in the shelf region and all those dead material which form on the shelf region due to the lack of oxygen they just uh, form the organic matter rich sediment so when wherever this oxygen minimum zone impinges on the continental uh, uh, shelf then here organic matter rich sediments are deposited okay so the biomass derived from fresh water algae and bacteria they are deposited in dysaerobic or anaerobic bottom waters of deep lakes okay so this is a very common type of uh, uh, model that is active in the deep lakes where the organic matter gets preserved all right so once the uh, organic matter rich sediments they get deposited then what will happen then now the petroleum generation has to take place so this solid organic matter in the source rock it gives rise to what we saw in the previous lecture that is kerogene kerogene so we saw the three processes the diagenesis catagenesis and metagenesis of kerogen and we saw on what types uh what type of kerogen is it algal rich kerogen that is type 1 is it leptinitic kerogen that is type 2 and if it is rich in terrestrial material then it is type 3 so all these uh, types of kerogen they give they uh, evolve through different evolutionary pathways and then they give rise to the petroleum so what is happen over uh, so what normally happens is that if you see uh, in this case the kerogen it is subjected to high temperature high temperature and this temperature is because of the variable depths of burial owing to the uh, geothermal gradient this kerogen as it gets encountered by the high temperature there is thermal degradation okay so this high temperature causes 
थर्मल डिग्रेडेशन ऑफ वॉट ऑफ केरोजिन एंड दिस स्टार्ट टू ट्रांसफॉर्म इन टू पेट्रोलियम कंपाउंड पेट्रोलियम कंपाउंड नो वॉट इज द मेन रिएक्शन ओवर हियर द मेन रिएक्शन इज क्रैकिंग क्रैकिंग cracking is the breaking of large chain carbon bond so this petroleum it is formed by cracking which is the breaking of carbon carbon bonds and to break that carbon carbon bonds there has to be a large amount of thermal energy which is also called as activation energy so uh, at higher temperature levels the petroleum compounds they are generated by the cracking of carbon carbon bonds within the kerogen structure and once they do so then the uh, you know that complex compound which has several aliphatic uh, side chains or aromatic structures they get broken down so petroleum is basically a simple organic compound ch uh, chained or you know smaller chain organic compounds which are derived from large or complex organic material now these reactions they result in gradual changes in the elemental composition of kerogen especially in a decrease of hydrogen content so this cracking you know as the kerogen gets more and more uh, thermally degraded it loses its hydrogen content so this process of uh, uh, transformation of kerogen with increasing temperature it is called as maturation and this maturation it is of two types the catagenesis and the metagenesis so these two processes they are called as maturation i have already explained this process in the previous lecture now at which stage at which stage this kerogen is right now will give us whether it will give us the oil or gas other than that it is also important to know that this kerogen is of which type okay so uh, in in the maturation and generation of petroleum heat is the main driving force so here you see that if the temperature so i as i have previously also explained to you various books give a different range of temperature so you will have to keep in mind if it is at 60 to 150 degree celsius they will generate oil and we say the kerogen is in oil window and if it is between uh, 150 to 250 degree celsius it will generate gas and we will say it is uh you know it is in the gas window okay further on which type of uh, kerogen is available will show different type of maturity which we shall discuss in the next class okay so i hope you understood uh how the source rock gets deposited and what are the features of the uh, petroleum generation which are dependent on the types of sediment the temperature conditions as well as the type of kerogen condition this van crevelin diagram you should remember by heart that how uh, the evolutionary pathways of kerogen they operate so just let me again write for your reference type 1 it is algal rich kerogen derived from algal material type 2 it is lipid rich kerogen okay lipid rich it is derived from phyto and zooplanktons phyto zoo planktons while the type 3 it is humic kerogen humic kerogen and it is derived from land plants okay so never forget that so in in the next lecture we shall see how the different types of kerogen they generate the various types of petroleum and then we shall move ahead to the uh, migration of petroleum so i hope this gets clear